Back in 2016, Prince Harry found his celebrity princess. Thank you so much. When Harry met Meghan, a fairy tale romance blossomed. I was beautifully surprised when I, when I walked into that room and saw her, and there she was sitting there. I was like, OK, well, I'm going to have to up, up, up my game. <laughs> they were engaged after a year, and the most spectacular of royal weddings followed. The wedding was phenomenal. It was a royal wedding, but it was on a completely different level. But then it all went horribly wrong. I thought that she could, not would, but that she could uh, be trouble. From matrimony to misery. My British friend said to me, I'm sure he's great, but you shouldn't do it because the British tabloids will destroy your life. So how did Meghan Markle lose her sparkle? A bit of breaking news tonight. And the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have announced that they are carving out what they call a new role for themselves. And how did she go from media darling to public enemy number one? The scrutiny has proved too much and palace life too stifling. We chart the meteoric rise and dramatic fall of the royal couple. She verged on the political when she was talking about women's empowerment. The royals don't do that. As their dream turned into a nightmare. I never thought that this would be easy, but I thought it would be fair. They said their goodbyes, handed back their royal titles. You've got the most recognisable members of the royal family, international superstars, if you like, suddenly announcing tonight that they're going to step back as, as senior members of the royals. I mean, it is quite staggering news. And jetted off to Canada. The monarchy finds itself in a moment of, of turmoil, flux, and a genuine crisis. We ask, Meghan, where did it all go wrong? In her dating years, Meghan was said to be an avid reader of 90s book, The Rules, a self-help dating guide read by millions worldwide. But the rules ain't got nothing on the Meghan Markle handle. Beginning, of course, with step one, be born into showbiz. To bag your Prince Charming, it always helps to start off in life with celebrity connections. And with Mum Doria and Dad Tom working in the entertainment industry, Meghan was all set. Meghan has a true showbiz upbringing. Her parents actually met on the set of General Hospital. Her dad was working on the lighting, her mom was temping there. It was the late 70s when my parents met. My dad was a lighting director for a soap opera, and my mom was a temp at the studio. I like to think he was drawn to her sweet eyes and her afro, plus their shared love of antiques. Whatever it was, they married and had me. They moved into a house in the valley in LA to a neighbor. Hi, Cub, you like these Unsurprisingly, Megan soon caught the acting bug and would often visit her dad on the set of long-running TV sitcom Married with Children. Megan had very much a showbiz upbringing. She would have been on set occasionally. She would have met famous actors and actresses probably from a young age um, and understood that they were just people and understood that there is a work that goes on behind the camera because that's what her dad did. So she would have seen the reality of what it means to be famous very early age. Married with children was, at the time, considered so risque, it was even boycotted by some viewers. Yeah. So uh, I grew up on the set of Married with Children every day after school for 10 years. I was there. Wow. I know. It's a very perverse place for a little girl who went to Catholic school, no less, to grow up. <laughs> there were a lot of times my dad would say, Meg, why don't you go and help with the craft services room over there? This is just a little off color for your eyes. I allowed to watch it at home. I could watch the end credits so I could give the screen a kiss when I saw my dad's name go by. I, I mean, they seem very close as father, daughter, and I mean, she was a striking child. She was beautiful, and everyone would comment on how cute she was. But beyond that, and more important than that, was the fact she was just a very nice little girl and very respectful and uh, just really a sweet kid to be around. I think one of the things that Megan possesses, which is so ideal for her current role, is a comfortableness, a level of ease in front of a camera. And part of that would have been because she was raised to see the other side of a camera. Like her future hubby, Megan's parents divorced when she was little. And from age six, she lived with her mother. But even if she didn't know it yet, with her immersion into the world of showbiz, little Megan's journey to find her Prince Charming had already...
begun. As developing a social conscience from a very early age is step number two. We all know royals love a good charity fundraiser and supporting important causes. So to increase your chances of royal romance, get involved with a good cause from an early age. Although Meghan's parents were divorced, together they instilled in her a sense of social justice. My mom and dad came from Little, so they made a choice to give a lot. Buying turkeys for homeless shelters at Thanksgiving, delivering meals to patients in hospice care, donating any spare change in their pockets to those asking for it. This is what I grew up seeing, so that is what I grew up being. A young adult woke up when I knew something was wrong. While still at school, unbeknownst to her, young Meghan was already learning one of the key attributes to being a princess, helping those less fortunate. She volunteered at a soup kitchen in one of the most impoverished areas of downtown LA. One day, after class, Meghan approached me and she said, tell me about more about serving on Skid Row. I suggested that she visit the place where I had volunteered because I knew that she would be physically safe there. And she not only volunteered there a few times, but she continued to volunteer at the soup kitchen throughout her time at Immaculate, which was through her senior year. Megan always took it a step further, not just distributing food, but learning people's names, learning their stories, because that's where I think her compassion comes from her connection with people. I think it's very important to know that her heart is in everything she does. I got this letter from one of the students who was in her group. This student was very shy. She was very unsure of herself. She was kind of a bit of a loner. And Megan wrote her the most wonderful, loving note, even though Megan was not her close friend at all. So I just like to read it because this gives you a sense of this is the real Megan. So it goes, Dear Michelle, you are so strong and so wonderful. Your courage in strength in times of hardships is as admirable as your optimism and friendly nature. I am so lucky to have you in my group and to be able to lead you on this adventure. Never stop sharing your beautiful spirit and always remember how special you are. I am here if you ever need me. I love you, Megan. Megan was already starting to make changes, but coming up, we see how her voice reached all the way to the White House. It just wasn't right, and something needed to be done. And then, in our step-by-step -step guide to bagging a prince, we reveal how getting to Hollywood... Any actress in America needs a huge breakthrough, and Suits was that show. ...helped prepare her for her future role. I think it well equips her for the intrusiveness that accompanies being a member of the royal family. While still at school, Meghan had developed a strong social conscience. And as she grew, so too did her passion for change. Please welcome Meghan Markle. Which in 1993, Took her all evening. That doesn't feel like enough, does it? It's just great evening. Maybe that's better. The fact that Megan is interested in these causes, that's not new. It's, uh, it's not something that she's taken up after a, a life of celebrity that she's suddenly found out that she needs to help people. It really started from, from the very beginning when she was just a little girl. So Megan's first foray into activism came when she was 11 years old and she and some classmates were watching commercials and analyzing them for their social studies class. The gloves are coming off. Women are fighting greasy pots and pans with ivory clear. The tagline said, women all over America are fighting greasy pots and pans. <laughs> Two boys from my class said, yeah, that's where women belong, in the kitchen. I remember feeling shocked and angry and also just feeling so hurt. It just wasn't right and something needed to be done. My name is Megan Markle, I'm 12 years old. 
Last week at my school, we decided to watch the news for social studies. While jumping through the channels, we saw a commercial for the new ivory clear dishwashing liquid. In the commercial, they said women are battling grease, meaning only women do dishes. And this infuriated Megan, and she went home, talked to her dad about it. Her dad encouraged her to write letters to various people. Megan wrote to Procter & Gamble, the company who made the advert, to then First Lady Hillary Clinton, and to children's current affairs show, Nick News, who sent a reporter to interview her. I don't think it's right for kids to grow up thinking these things, that just mom does everything. So I was wondering if you would be able to change your commercial to people all over America. Thank you, Meghan Markle. Incredibly, the 12-year-old's lobbying paid off. And it was roughly a month later when the soap manufacturer, Procter & Gamble, changed the commercial. The gloves are coming off. People are fighting greasy pots and pans with ivory clear. She had a sense that she could affect change, even though she was just one small person. She had a voice. If you see something that you don't like or offended by on, te on television or any other place, write letters and send them to the right people, and you can really make a difference for not just yourself, but lots of other people. Propelled into the limelight at such a tender age, as an adult, Megan's passion to effect change would burn no less brightly and push her closer to the world of her prince-to-be, to her future beau's heart. Such as becoming global ambassador for international children's charity World Vision, promoting sanitation projects in remote villages. Megan's visits to countries like Rwanda have focused on uh, girls and women. All of these speak to her concern um, for female and really wanting to make a difference that way. You'll feel really good at the end of the day knowing that you've been a part of that. I gotta get these kids home. I'm gonna go take a picture with them. <laughs> we all know that charity is a huge, huge thing for Prince Harry. He's been working with various charities for years and it's something that's really close to his heart because of how important it was to his late mother, Diana. If you wanted to impress him, doing a lot of charity work would probably go down very well. But being charitable alone might not be enough to bag a prince. So bring on step number three. Of course, one possible way to bring yourself closer to royalty is to become a celeb. Easy, right? Megan was a natural-born performer after all. Long before I taught Megan, um, I saw her in the school plays. And she was one of those girls when she was on stage, you were drawn to watch her because she just had this charisma and this charm and she was really good. We have a musical and a play every year and she was certainly one of the many shining lights that we have here mm -hmm. at Immaculate Heart. Mm -hmm. After leaving high school, Megan's dramatic flair led her to enroll at the prestigious Northwestern University, where she studied theater and international relations international relations and basically showbiz. It is a perfect combination for someone who's going to be in the royal family. There's a lot of showbiz involved in the royal family and you know, no one talks about it, but it is like being an actress. You have to be so excited to meet people, some of whom may even say something that's a bit insensitive or rude, and you have to still make small talk and still smile all the time. You get your picture taken. Megan's preparation really couldn't have been better for this role. Prior to attending university, she auditioned for roles in music videos for artists such as Shakira. After the aftermath this of the after, audition. This is the aftermath of the audition, and it went pretty well. We just had to dance crazily, and um, so I did, and it was um, tiring. We just all danced like wild women, and I was shaking my hair around, and so that's, that's that. While at university, Megan showed promise on stage, starring in a number of student movies. Back home in LA one Christmas, a friend introduced her to a manager who'd watched one of her films. He offered to find her work. In return, the success was not an easy one. A young actor, actress, trying to break into the business, it is not easy. My parents had been so supportive, watching me audition, trying to make ends meet, taking all the odds and ends jobs to pay my bills. I was doing calligraphy, and I was a hostess at a restaurant, and all those things that actors do. There's so many people out here who want to 
broken into the entertainment industry. Uh, it's, it's difficult. I had a beat up Ford Explorer Sport that rattled like a steamboat engine in the morning. It was burning out. I had started to give up. It was tired and running on empty, going from audition to audition, just as I was. I mean, you really have to be very self-promoting and you have to be willing to, you know, knock on doors and be very um, motivated and have good self-esteem because you get eaten alive out here. But Megan remained determined to make it in Hollywood, despite the challenges along the way. I would drive to auditions and park at the back of the parking lot far from the eyes of anyone who could see me unlocking the trunk and crawling into my car through its only feasible entry point. I would play it off, obviously, as though I was looking for something, reaching so deep for something that my car almost sucked me in to get it. Much like my experience in Hollywood, to be honest. Struggling, climbing hurdles, searching for something that I couldn't even see, and just reaching for it. By now, in her mid-twenties, all Megan had to show for her efforts were bit parts in TV soap operas, dramas, and the occasional movie. Fame was a distant dream. In 2006, she landed a job as a suitcase girl on the US version of quick show Deal or No Deal, filming up to seven shows a day. Megan, open the case. For somebody like Megan, um, appearing as essentially an adornment on a game show would not be her ideal job. I'm sure she appreciated the paycheck, but she would have felt creatively unfulfilled. Just to be seen as a pair of legs or a pretty girl holding a briefcase full of cash, that's not what Megan was after. But unfortunately, that is part of what leads to fame. You have to kind of pay your dues. You don't just start out on a show like Suits. I would put that in the category of things I was doing while I was auditioning to try to make ends meet. I was the ill-fated number, which for some reason no one would ever choose. I would end up standing up there forever in these terribly uncomfortable and inexpensive five-inch heels, just waiting. But they were limited. Her dad was a lighting director. He wasn't an executive producer. So Megan had to pay her dues like a lot of other young, beautiful actresses today. Along with the fierce competition facing any young actress trying to break Hollywood, Megan had a further challenge, her mixed race heritage. It took quite a few years for Megan really to be comfortable with her identity. Hollywood didn't help with that, and it must have been very hurtful and very frustrating for her at times. It's not easy making it in Hollywood if you're not blonde and typically, you know, the aesthetic look. And Megan Markle was definitely struggling in her years trying to make it. I'm biracial. Most people can't tell what I'm mixed with, and so much of my life has felt like being a fly on the wall. And so some of the slurs that I've heard, or the really offensive jokes, or the names, it's just hit me in a really strong way. Being ethnically ambiguous, as I was pegged in the industry, meant I could audition for virtually any role. I wasn't black enough for the black roles, and I wasn't white enough for the white ones, leaving me somewhere in the middle as the ethnic chameleon who couldn't book a job. But Megan's big break was closer than she thought. At one audition, a casting director advised Megan to go for a more natural look. This would change her outlook forever. She stopped me in mid-scene and said so simply, you need to know that you're enough. She saw all that self-doubt beaming through the self-tanner and excessive blush. You need to know that you're enough. Less makeup, more Megan. And that moment for me was a wake-up call. Megan had started dating film and TV producer Trevor Engelson in the early noughties. And in 2011, after seven years together, they got married. Coming up, the moment Meghan found herself in social circles that led eventually to Prince Harry. This was her journey. It started there. And we find out what princes do on a first date. When she was sitting there, I was like, OK, well, I really have to up my game. <laughs> Bagging 
Major TV role isn't easy, but luckily for Megan, her breakthrough was just around the corner. When she auditioned for a new legal drama series, it was just another day in the office. Or so she thought. Suits was set in New York, but filmed in Toronto. It was the fifth pilot I would have filmed. But I have imagined that this show would not just change my career, but also change my life. Any actress in America needs a huge breakthrough. And what they want is to be on a massive show. And Suits was that show for Meghan Markle. Megan won the role of Rachel Zane, an ambitious young lawyer. Hi, I'm Rachel Zane. I'll be giving you your orientation. Wow, you're pretty. Good. You hit on me. We can get it out of the way that I'm not interested. No, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't hitting on you. Trust me. I've given dozens of these, and without fail, whatever new hot shot it is thinks that because I'm just a paralegal, that I will somehow be blown away by his dazzling degree. Let me assure you, I won't. Megan's character, Rachel Zane, was what we might call a grafter. She worked her way up, she had rich parents, but she didn't want to take any help from them. I guess there could be some crossover between Megan's character, Rachel in Suits, and her normal everyday life. Her role within that, she's a strong, independent woman. Do you know what I mean? She commands respect, she commands authority. So when you look at Megan in, in everyday life, she does that as well. You know, there is kind of some fluidity between those two roles there, for sure. Very strong, driven, independent women, but they really have a heart of gold. They're a bit of a soft touch. They'll help anybody. Um, we know this of Megan, and um, I think as the show went along, Megan was able to incorporate more of herself into the character. The flip-flop culture is part of just who I am. I love my cutoffs and flip-flops and being as relaxed as can be, which is why it's so fun to dress up and play Rachel. Finally, after years of Graft, she'd landed her big break. The show was a hit. The USA Cable Network commissioned a second series, and Megan moved full time to Canada to be near the studio. Megan's move to Toronto was a big deal. She's very close with her mother, Doria, and she moved away from home and her friends in LA to go start a new life in Canada. So Megan chose not to live in like the poshest area of Toronto. She chose Seton Village, which is more back, tree-lined, and people keep to themselves, and that's exactly what Megan did. So much so that her neighbors didn't even know who she was. But not for long. The show soon became an international smash, catapulting Megan to fame and to becoming a household name. I'd never watched since. I'd, I'd never heard of Megan before. Well, nearly a household name. He had to say that. She was so sexy in it. He couldn't say, like, I've actually seen her, like, passionately kissing loads of guys. And I was like, yeah, I want to marry that. When she landed the role of, in Suits, Megan became a legitimate bona fide celebrity. This was the first time that, you know, she would have had her name called out on a red carpet. This was the first time she would have been papped. So this was a big adjustment for her, and it all happened away from home. But being away from home wasn't without problems. For two, the problem with the marriage was the distance. And no sooner were they married than she got the gig on Suits, and she was in Toronto, and he was in L.A., and the relationship just didn't last. Megan may have been unlucky in love, but her star was on the rise. And with stardom came power. Before filming season four of Suits, Megan complained to the program makers. She once said that every script seems to begin with, Rachel enters wearing a towel. And at some point, she put her foot down and was like, no, I'm not doing that. That's she doesn't need to be that. And the character evolved. I didn't think you'd be so naive. Excuse me? Your job wasn't to talk to Mr. Bailey once and after being moved by his tale of woe, tell me to jump him to the top of the pile. It was to assess his case and present evidence. And it's exactly what I'm doing here. I just left two boxes of textbook prosecutorial misconduct with your secretary. You found all of that since yesterday? Yes, because while I may only be a second year law student, I have been a practicing paralegal for the past eight years. Looks like I have some reading to do. I'm sorry for interrupting your day. Good afternoon, Miss Zane. Megan's global exposure as Rachel Zane was perfect prep for another future role. I think it well equips her for the intrusiveness that accompanies being a member of the royal family and being followed at every turn because she was very used to, you know, sort of putting her own life in the spotlight. So, having been working hard on suits and needing a well-earned break, Megan decided to have a summer holiday in
The summer of 2016, which turned out to be a very important summer for Meghan, um, was actually initially um, a bit of a getaway, a bit of a girl's holiday, um, a, a romp around Europe, a celebration of the fact that she was newly single, and she decided that she'd come on a road trip. When she came to London, Meghan had a couple of girlfriends over here. Misha Nunu had opened up quite an elite circle of friends to Meghan. Among them was Violet von Westenholtz, who was working for Ralph Lauren at the time as a PR and had the opportunity to dress Meghan Markle in some outfits when she was doing some promotional work for Suits. And while they were dressing Meghan, she and Violet established quite a nice rapport, so much so that Meghan was invited into the VIP hospitality tent at Wimbledon that summer to watch her good friend Serena Williams play a game of tennis. Obviously, you go to Wimbledon and you hang out in the VVIP area. She was sitting in the royal box, pretty much. She was just close by. All the pictures have shown she's like an arm's throw away from Pippa Middleton. Is rumoured to have suggested Meghan might like her friend Harry. That's Prince Harry to you, who also just happened to be single. Amazingly, for a royal romance, it started on Instagram. And Harry had had a look through Meghan's Instagram page. I was told Meghan had had a look through Harry's Instagram page and it was Violet who really had brought them together. She played matchmaker. Whoever set them up must be sitting there literally patting themselves on the back. Can you imagine being the person that introduced them because it's like the best PR move ever? I didn't know much about him and so the only thing that I had asked her when she said she wanted to set us up was I had one question. I said, well, is he nice? <laughs> Their first date is believed to be at Soho House in London. Megan had strong ties to Soho House. She was a regular at the Toronto Outpost and very good friends with Marcus Anderson, who is one of the directors of Soho House. Marcus Anderson cleared rooms and corridors so that they could meet completely in private without the risk of being spotted or photographed. I was beautifully surprised when I, when I walked into that room and saw her and there she was sitting there. I was like, OK, well, I'm going to have to up, up, up my game. <laughs> I'm going to sit down and have a and make sure I've got a good chat. They got to know each other over a bottle of rosé. They clicked, I was told, immediately over their joint passion for charity work, their love of philanthropic work, and there was an immediate spark. We met twice back to back, two dates in London last July. Yes. Then it was, I think, about three, maybe four weeks later that I managed to <laughs> persuade her to come and join me in Botswana. What happened next was the start of fairy tales as the couple embarked on a whirlwind romance. Harry and Meghan, they were both astonished at how quickly their relationship developed and how deeply they felt for one another almost from the get-go. I think perhaps a sign that things had gotten off to a good start and were actually really accelerating rather quickly in terms of a royal romance was when Meghan started referring to Harry as has to her friends and he was affectionately calling her Meg to his. Though originally worlds apart, they had in common after all, both with divorced parents, both famous and sharing an interest in the developing world. It was one of the first things we started talking about when we met was just the different things that we wanted to do in the world and how passionate we were about seeing change. I think that's what got date two <laughs> in the books, probably. Yeah, that's right. Plenty to talk about. And date two quickly led to their first trip away together, a mere month later, on safari in Botswana a country close to Harry's heart after first visiting following his mother's death 19 years earlier. We camped out with each other under the stars. We spent some kind of joy crucial to me to make sure that we had a, a chance to, to get to know each other. A secret long distance relationship then ensued with the occasional clue, such as the couple being separately pictured wearing matching blue bracelets and the odd tantalizing social media post. But it wasn't long before the couple went public. So the next step to bagging a prince is perhaps the hardest, the engagement. So Haz and Meg were love's young dream, but there was one little problem. Of course, they had the issue of living in separate countries. Harry based in London, living at Kensington Palace, and Meghan being in Toronto, where she was filming Suits. So from the early stages, they knew that this relationship, if it going to take off was going to have its challenges. More often than not, it was Prince Harry jumping on a scheduled flight 
incognito in a baseball cap and a hoodie with just a single protection officer in tow and taking a regular British Airways usually flight to Toronto. He was never seen, never spotted. And so they were able to conduct those early months of their relationship in clandestine and get away with it. They did have this pact to see each other. That's why the long distance relationship worked. And the other agreement they had was that they would tell as few people as possible. For Meghan, that pretty much stopped at her parents and two of her best friends. For Harry, he confided in his father, his brother, and two of his best friends. And by doing that, they really kept it in a very tight inner circle. Astonishingly, the couple managed to keep things on the down low for three months until late October, when the cat, or should that be Corgi, was out of the bag. After an anonymous source leaked the story to the press. Well, I can't say much about how the came about apart from that the information that he was seeing Megan came to light and um, what was interesting in that circumstance covering a story like that is normally a name might be mentioned linked to Prince Harry and you wouldn't know who they were and you'd have to try and research them and you might not find very much online because they're a private individual of course in Megan's case there was reams and reams of information about this American actress with illustrious history not only of starring in shows like Suits but also with this huge charitable side to her the fact that she had been involved with the UN and everything became apparent. So, really, you have a one-fact story like that and it breaks and the rest of Fleet Street is then playing catch-up. And it was then after the story broke that you found descending on Meghan's house, chasing after anyone that ever knew her, chasing after family members. I think both of us were totally surprised by the, the reaction after the first five, six months of what we had to ourselves. Now everyone knew about their relationship, but would everyone approve? especially Harry's inner circle of trusted friends. But they also welcomed her, and by the March of 2017, Meghan was invited to his best friend's wedding. Harry flew Meghan out to Montego Bay for the wedding of old Etonian pal Tom Inskip. She was made to feel very at home. The friends were very welcoming, and she started to actually forge friendships with these people on her own. And that's really lovely that, you know, Prince Harry the wedding of his pal and his, and his pals are saying you guys could be next down the aisle I mean what's better than that they could obviously see that this is genuine this is a this is a real thing well one of the things I was told by someone at that wedding in Jamaica was that they'd never seen Prince Harry look so happy and in fact at the wedding reception there were jokes of you two will be next and actually those they, those were accurate predictions because they were coming up the royal to be his first public appearance. I don't know how many people were actually watching the wheelchair tennis match because a lot of people were watching Harry and Meghan. And just how did Meghan's prince pop the question? I had the ring in my finger and I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? She was, oh, yes, the ring. <laughs> Extraordinary, with no attempts to hide away they watched the wheelchair tennis at the Invictus Games. It was open to the public. Anybody could go and watch the wheelchair tennis match. Although it has to be said, I don't know how many people were actually watching the wheelchair tennis match because a lot of people were watching Harry and Meghan. They were very touchy-feely. They were laughing together, staring into each other's eyes, whispering sweet nothings into each other's ears. It was everything that their adoring fans had wanted. I remember when I first heard that Harry and Meghan going out almost came from, from nowhere. Do you know what I mean? That the whole process was very, very quick, it seemed, in comparison to kind of conventional relationships. But, I mean, come on, this isn't, you know, a normal relationship by anyone's standards. It's, you know, a prince, you know, and a, and a Hollywood actress. Harry and Meghan were now well and truly in the public spotlight. But after 16 months of dating, Meghan got her private moment. While staying with Harry at night, popped the question, and Meghan said yes. This afternoon, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle stepped hand in hand into the sunken garden at Kensington Palace. Step number five was done. The ring was on it. This was the news the world had been waiting for. Meghan mania ensued, only fueled by a picture-perfect photo call on the 27th of November, 2017. Harry, when did you know she was the one? The very first time we met. What struck me most on the engagement day was how calm, considered, sophisticated Meghan was. So 
Unlike other royal fiancés before her, Meghan had her Hollywood training to give her all the poise she needed and was quite at home in front of the cameras. You guys, thank you so much. I was reminded of the days when Prince Charles and Princess Diana came out on their engagement day and how awkward and uh, inarticulate it all was. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Instead of in love, me. <laughs> It didn't have the right feel to it. And even when Catherine and William became engaged, Catherine seemed very, very nervous. No, it, it's very important to me, and, uh, you know, I, I hope we'll you know, be able to have a happy family ourselves. Straight here, please! Yes, yes. Not so Megan. She was the one who seemed the least nervous of the lot. I think it's absolutely clear from their closeness, from their body chemistry, from the energy between them, that these two knew absolutely what it meant to be in love, and they were truly, madly, deeply in love. This engagement had the world's press queuing up to get the perfect front-page shot of their real-life American princess. And it came right at the end. The real picture is the one where they think they're out of view, and they put arms round each other's waist. Very unroyal and very lovely. And it would seem the look Meg chose for this all-important announcement came from one of our very own royal watchers. There's a really funny story about me wearing a particular coat, a particular pair of shoes and a dress and visiting Buckingham Palace where I met Prince Harry and Prince William. About three weeks later, the biggest story of the year, Prince Harry announces that he's marrying Meghan Markle and she happens wearing exactly the same outfit as me. So, one of two things happened. Either Prince Harry saw what I was wearing and thought, I definitely want my bride-to-be to look just as good as this girl. That's it. Or Meghan Markle was somewhere on the grounds and really rated my outfit. Then came the pitch-perfect press call, where an uber-relaxed Meghan... This is the fact that she is a product of Hollywood, product of television, product of entertainment and therefore there's a sort of ease in communication and there is an inbuilt knowledge of what the media are trying to get at. It was definitely a setup. <laughs> it was a blind date. Blind this was a world with which Meghan had been familiar before she met Harry and her ease was there for all to see. Because I'm from the States you don't grow up with the same understanding of, of the royal family and mm. so while I now understand very clearly there's a, a global interest there. She's different because she represents the global world we're in, the fascination we have in America, the fascination we have in celebrity, diversity, and she's a very strong woman. Just an amazing surprise. It was so sweet and, and natural and very romantic. I had actually been told by one of his friends that he had planned to pop the question in Botswana. For whatever reason, he didn't. It happened a few weeks later, while they were at home, at Nottingham Cottage, roasting a chicken. Utter domestic simplicity and bliss. And, um, incredibly romantic. He got on one knee. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I could barely let you finish proposing. I said, like, yeah. can I say yes now? She didn't even let me finish. I said, can I say yes, I can I say yes now? And then, then there was hugs and I had the ring in my finger. And I was like, can I, can I give you the ring? She was, oh, yes, the ring. Meghan and Harry were united in their passion for change. And in the months following their engagement, Meghan had thrown herself into charity, winning the hearts of the British public. It was clear from day one that she was like a duck to water. She is absolutely natural at this. Very engaging, very warm, lots of eye contact. Harry was showing off his new fiance far and wide, and she charmed everyone from all walks of life, including those who walked on four legs. She even wore a matching coat for the occasion. You can see the American effect of Meghan Markle in every single photo call and every single walkabout. When Meghan goes on walkies with Harry, she's hugging people. In Nottingham, the couple visited charities that were close to Harry's mother's heart. You can see the pride in Prince Harry. I mean, it was a joy to watch. While back in London, a visit to Brixton brought Meghan even closer to the community. Believe it or not, 
everyone is listening, and I'm in the same room as the royal couple right now. They actually shook my hand. I didn't expect that. I thought, you know, it would just be a distance. Um, they were pretty cool. It was a real nice, good, feel-good factor. They should come more often. They really should. Now a Meg. But would this be the case with the in-laws? The next step in Meghan's journey would be getting to know the firm. And the hotly debated topic of her background was never far from the fore. You be, you be Harry, and I'm gonna be the, um, you know, Queen, <laughs> Queen Elizabeth, since I got this on, right? And you telling me about your, your girlfriend, okay? Um. Hello! Harry! <laughs> Grandmother, um, I met this beautiful woman, and <laughs> she just happens to be mixed with race. <laughs> Step six in our guide to bagging a prince is charming the in-laws. One of the things I found really amazing when I was charting this story was just how warmly welcomed Meghan had been into the royal fold right from the early stages. The early meetings with William and Kate and Charles and Camilla, they were very welcoming. And actually, the speed at which Meghan was introduced to the Queen was very surprising. When I looked back at Harry's relationship with Chelsea, it was several years before Chelsea was introduced to the Queen. Cressida, who dated Harry for two years, was never introduced to the Queen, but with a matter of mere months of dating her, Harry had Meghan meet the Queen. She's an incredible woman. And the, and the Corgis took to you straight away. <laughs> That's true. In fact, Queenie was so impressed that mere weeks after the couple's engagement, she took the unprecedented move of inviting Meghan to spend Christmas in Norfolk at Sandringham, giving Meg the opportunity for a serious charm offensive. It was a tremendous break with convention that the Queen invited Meghan, who was, after all, just a fiancé, to Sandringham, because normally it's just the wives and the husbands of members of the royal family who are allowed that. I was told that the Queen's feeling was this. She's preparing to give everything up for her grandson, her career, her identity, her nationality, her home in Toronto, everything to be with Harry. And the Queen's feeling was the very least we can do is to make her feel welcome at Christmas. It does show that the Queen is walking in step with the change of the guard at Buckingham Palace. This would have been a far different Christmas to the one Meghan spent in LA the previous year, with the historic 20,000-acre estate playing host to all sorts of little family quirks that would prove a challenge to any outsider. Well, Meghan would have had to get her head around quite a few uh, royal family traditions. They opened presents on Christmas Eve. The presents that they exchange aren't what you really expect for members of the royal family. They tend to share really jokey presents with one another. In America, you know, things will come beautifully wrapped and be quite extravagant. And this is the other end, and just uh, cakes in or an unusual thing to keep your corgis in. Meghan would have to embrace all these funny little customs, and clearly she did. <laughs> After spending the night in her unfamiliar surroundings, the bride in training faced her public in that most royal of festive traditions. The post-service walkabout at St. Mary Magdalene Church. Well, the Sandringham Church photo is the timeline through history. You have a snapshot every year of those people closest to the throne. Now, often you're looking at a picture of a child who was barely able to walk perhaps a year ago, and suddenly they come out of the church. That image will change. In a few years' time, you'll have those couples and their children will be going to church. In a few more years' time, and you may not have the older generation. This year, of course, was Meghan's year. The presence of the royal fiancé drew crowds that were even bigger than usual. The world's media was also out in force, but it was a member of the public who would snap the photo that cemented just how much Meghan was in with the younger royal crowd. Unfortunately for photographers on the ground, they just didn't quite seem to get a clear shot. And in the end, it came down to a member of the public, a lady called Karen Anvil. It was like a Mexican wave of cheers, so you knew they were coming. The photographers at the other end... <laughs> and they just happened to look over. And I took one photo, that's the thing. I took one photo and it was, yeah, the right one. 
When we saw that shot, it was an absolute no-brainer that it was going to be our cover shot because it was the only one that had captured that moment, the four of them together. And, you know, it symbolised quite a lot in terms of the royal family and where they're going in future. So, um, yeah, I mean, we were delighted to use it on the cover. And just like that, the Fab Four were born. Clearly, Meghan was well and truly fitting into the royal club. Just like the Queen, it seems the rest of the family were equally charmed by Harry Bow from across the pond. Another tick for Meghan. William was longing to meet her, and so was Catherine. And Catherine's been absolutely um, been wonderful. amazing, as is William as well. He, you know, fantastic support. And then my, my father as well. We had, we had a handful of teas and meetings, and, mm -hmm. and my grandparents as well have been, have been wonderful throughout this whole process. She found herself a true fan in the Duke of Edinburgh, and he was apparently hugely impressed with how well-read Meghan was. Meghan was now in with the in-laws. But coming up, events were to turn increasingly tricky. Dealing with critics from near... I think be trouble. ..and far. I think the very fact that Samantha wanted to do a book called The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister implies that maybe she was not over-fond of her younger half-sister. <laughs> Meghan was proved popular with the in-laws. The friends and was now conquering the British public. But what to do when you find out not everyone likes you? I don't know about this Meghan Markle. Yeah, she's too confident and self-assured. You see what I mean? This water feature is shit, isn't it? Yeah. Oh my God, I thought I was doing so well. When the news of Prince Harry was dated, an American actress first came out, I think that the reaction amongst the British public especially was equal parts excited and disapproving, because she's not British. From the very moment Harry and Meghan's relationship had broken in 2016, much of the press inevitably had gone raking through Meghan's past. They made it sound as though she had grown up in like the slums of LA, like riddled with like gangsters and drugs. With some reports focusing on the breakup of her parents' marriage and relationship with her half siblings time is seven minutes harry didn't help matters when he went on to guest edit bbc radio 4's today program it started well and morning very good to see you he got some of his mates on the show like this guy okay but i need a british accent but if you start if you start using long pauses between um the answers you're probably gonna get the face oh okay but during the course of the program harry answered one question about Megan. It was your future wife's first Christmas with the in-laws. Mm -hmm. How was it? Uh, she, she really enjoyed it. The family um, loved having her there. And, it's, you know, it's, 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 the, it's the family that she, I suppose she's never had. It's the family that she, I suppose she's never had, never, never had. But Harry's comments did not go down well with one member of his future wife's family. Megan's half-sister, Samantha, was very cross with what Harry said on the Today programme about the family not being close or a normal family. Samantha tweeted that that was really not the case. And she defended their as, as a normal family, a close family, a loving family, and didn't understand what Harry was talking about. And that wasn't the last we'd hear of Samantha, who went on to threaten publication of a tell-all book called Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister. I think the very fact that Samantha wanted to do a book called The Diary of Princess Pushy's Sister implies that maybe she was not over-fond of her younger half-sister and maybe is a little conflicted about Meghan's success. There's no bigger media vulture with this wedding than you. Is there, Miss Markle? I mean, how you have the gall to come on here and talk about media? You've been trashing it for two okay. years, you little vulture. I've made it clear in several interviews that you can't judge a book by its cover, and similarly, you can't judge a book by its title. Samantha also criticised Meghan's charity work. If you are interested in helping those less fortunate than yourself, it really should begin at home. Could all this bad publicity derail the wedding? And just how should Meghan respond to this particularly barbed attack? The temptation must have been huge for Meghan to have responded to the critics, who were, of course, her family members. She kept a dignified silence. I mean, you've got to feel for Meghan. What would you do if your family were being an absolute nightmare? It is seriously embarrassing. So she does what any of us would do. Hashtag ignore, ignore, ignore. But would Meghan...
be able to keep her composure in the face of her next critic. A certain ex-Tory MP, a die-hard royalist, who voiced her doubts about Meghan, not in private, but in the most public setting possible, the celebrity Big Brother house. OK, let's take yeah. a vote. I think she's trouble. Uh, how long do you think she's going to be? Five years, ten trouble? years, twenty years? Why do you think she's trouble, Anne? Background, um... Attitude, I... I worry. She's older than him. She's been married before. Yes. I add it all up and I'm uneasy. But there we go. Quite frankly, I was shocked when Anne Widdicombe said that what she said. I mean, I've always thought that she was a sensible woman. She seems to be jumping to conclusions without looking at any evidence. The ex-minister's comments sent the Twitter sphere into meltdown. When I was on Big Brother, I was called every ick and every ist going. I was homophobic, xenophobic, uh, racist, sexist, misogynist. Nothing I said could have been remotely construed as racist by any sensible observer. I mean, all I said was I thought that because of her background and I was thinking of freewheeling Hollywood background, you know, former marriage, all the rest of it, uh, that because of her background, I thought that she could, not would, but that she could uh, be trouble. She had, I think, the older generation's view of this is an outsider, a foreigner, coming into a very British organisation, almost, you could say. How is that going to work? The thing that all of us have to do is adapt. We're in the here and now. Embrace. But one woman who was not prepared to embrace was Jo Marnie, girlfriend of then UKIP leader Henry Bolton, who sent a series of racist texts. Even then, Meghan kept quiet. The royal's mantra is often put up points, so actually her approach, maintaining that dignified silence, not justifying or even giving any credence to these claims, some of which were really quite unpleasant. Well, it was a very royal approach to things. Look, Meghan is showing the makings of a true princess. You've got to have that decorum. You've got to, on some occasions, actually, you know, Keep silent and pick your battles. Even more flack came Meghan's way when she took to the stage with her potential prince, his brother and Kate at the Royal Foundation in February 2018. People say, well, you're helping women find their voices. And I fundamentally disagree with that because women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice. They need to feel empowered to use it and people need to be encouraged to listen. And I think there is no better time than to really continue to shine a light on women feeling empowered and people really helping to support them. She verged on the political uh, when she was talking about women's empowerment and it was all a bit Me Too-ish. The royals don't do that. And indeed, the day that the royals start engaging in political causes is the day you get a lot of controversy. There is a very good reason why the royals stay off politics, and it's to avoid precisely that. Not everyone shared Anne's view. It's refreshing, because she isn't saying things that are incredibly controversial that we actually wouldn't stand by or back or, or believe in. These are really important points, important issues that she's raising, especially when she's touching on feminism. But was Meghan risking her relationship with the royals and the public? She's clever. She's using her voice in, in a good way. And she has actually been backed by the palace. But still the criticism came and the palace had to release a statement defending her. Was this one step too far? This is the first time that we've heard anyone associated with the royal family talking about those campaigns. The Kensington Palace stressed it would have been impossible for Meghan to talk about issues surrounding female empowerment without talking about those campaigns. Well, I think that by touching on the Me Too campaign, Meghan probably knew that there was going to be some kickback, and indeed there was. But actually, she's got far more people saying, this is great, this is what the royal family needs to be doing more of. Phew. Looked like Meghan had found just the right balance to please the palace, her people, and most importantly, her prince. So, next step in our guide, embrace your prince's religion. She signed up to the Church of England, of which the Queen is supreme governor. And exactly 100 days after her engagement announcement, Meghan was baptised in the chapel of St James's Palace by the Archbishop of Canterbury. It was very special. It was beautiful. Though she had attended a Catholic school in LA, Meg had a Protestant background. Her father...
a member of the Episcopal Church of the United States. It would not have been an enormous step, you know, to get baptised, but it was a big step in a way. But I think out of deference to the Queen and to her very strong faith, it sort of tidied things up and it all goes well for the future because she will have to attend many, you know, services in Church of England cathedrals. Coming up, Meghan's headed ever nearer to that chapel of love, but the journey would become increasingly problematic. With a guest list to organise... Have you got an invite to the royal wedding? Have I? Yeah. Not that I know. And dramas coming thick and fast from her very own family. All of a sudden, his health isn't good and he can't come to the wedding. Da, da, da. Welcome back, where we find Megan almost at the final furlong of her romantic journey. But managing your wedding carefully was not to prove so easy for our Meg. First hurdle, the date. The wedding of Prince Harry to Meghan Markle. The date, the 19th of May, 2018. Recent royal weddings had all been held on weekdays, but not this one. I think that they thought, we want people to enjoy this, so why not do it on a Saturday? And if you think about most weddings that you and I go to, they're at the weekend. So why wouldn't you follow suit? But there was one reason to avoid that Saturday. It had already been announced as the date of the FA Cup final. As president of the Football Association, Harry's brother, Prince William, was expected to take his usual place in the Royal Box at Wembley. And millions more were looking forward to watching the game on TV. I think my wife would probably want to see the, um, the Royal Wedding. So what I'd probably do, I'd probably leave her on her own, make some of her friends. I'd go somewhere else where like-minded people want to watch the FA Cup final. I would so prefer to watch a Royal Wedding, not interested in football. Harry and Meghan solved the problem for TV viewers. They announced that their ceremony would begin at noon, several hours earlier than kick-off time. But Wills decided to avoid the fixture clash altogether, scrapping his Wembley appointment to concentrate fully on his little brother's wedding. Next hurdle, the tricky protocol of who to invite to a royal wedding. Have you got an invite to the royal wedding? Have I? Yeah. Not that I know. Would you like to go? I want them to be happy. I really want them to be happy. They look like a lovely couple. Meghan Markle did say you were a divisive misogynist. Well, I still hope they're happy. It was a source of quite a lot of amusement at him. So Donald Trump is mad because Prince Harry didn't invite him to the, to the wedding, to the royal wedding over there in England. I don't even know why. I don't know why you mad. You shouldn't even be surprised, uh, Donald. Don't nobody like you. The apparent decision to snub the US president may have been a source of jokes for comedians. But according to some sections of the media, it was also a potential embarrassment for the Queen. Could this dash all Meghan's good work? Especially in light of reports that the couple had invited Trump's predecessor, Barack Obama, a friend to them both. But as Harry and Meghan's wedding was a state event, that meant the couple could pretty much invite whoever they wanted. Now, this is not a state occasion, this wedding. He can invite his friends and Meghan's friends. He doesn't have to invite Trump. It's as simple as that. So, the date was set, the invites were out, the corgis were brushed, and all was looking rosy for the big day, and for Meghan to finally become Mrs Prince Harry. Until... That week lead-up to the wedding was like watching episode of EastEnders. It was an extraordinary week, completely overshadowed by the debacle over Mr Markle. We were told that Thomas Markle would be walking his daughter down the aisle. In fact, a story that broke the weekend before in the Mail on Sunday undid all of that. Thomas Markle was revealed to have been staging fake pictures for the press to bolster his image pre-wedding for the reported sum of $100,000. First of all, the pictures are leaked. Her dad is posing for pictures with paparazzi. Such was the embarrassment Mr. Markle felt he'd caused to his daughter that at the 11th hour, he pulled out of the wedding. It got so confusing. It was like, is he going to be coming to the wedding? Isn't he? Meghan, I was told, was utterly heartbroken. She said that she forgave him for the photographs. She wanted him there to walk her down the aisle on the big day, and he agreed to 
he would do it until all of a sudden his health isn't good and he can't come to the wedding. Da, da, da. Thomas Markle said he felt that the heart attack had probably been brought about by his son writing an open letter in one of the tabloids, basically telling Harry that it wasn't too late to get out of this wedding and that his sister was nothing but trouble. The whole of the country was talking about this. What is going to happen? And then finally, we had a statement. It was a roller coaster of emotions. In fact, prompted Meghan to issue her very first solo public statement. And very tellingly, that statement began with the word sadly. It must have been really difficult, because in the end, you know, it was announced that her father, without an invitation. Former sister-in-law Tracy Dooley, that's ex-wife of the half-brother who just trashed Meghan in a letter, jetted into Heathrow with sons Tyler and Thomas, plus a shed load of baggage in every sense. There's more likelihood that I would have got an invite. They turn up, got all the suitcases, you see them having their pictures taken in the airport, you're thinking, what is going on here? Because apparently they either think they're going to get a last minute, you know, somebody cancelled, you can come to the wedding now, or they're just going to make money off the British media and do loads of interviews. It's all about the... be a pretty exclusive event. Right. Um, so, I mean, if, if, they, if they feel like they, they would like to invite us, we'd be honoured, and um, if not, we're going to be cheering her on and... Yeah. Totally um, supporting her, yeah, no matter what. And then on top of all of this, Megan has to find out that her nephew Tyler is growing cannabis and has even called his special batch the Markle Sparkle. I mean, it was just disastrous from start to finish. And I think actually everyone, not just Megan, was pleased when they packed their bags and went right back to where they came from. Cue an epic sigh of relief at the palace. Despite all these problems, the wedding stayed on track brings us nicely to step 11. Finally, on the 19th of May 2018, less than two years after Harry and Meghan's very first date in Soho House, the day we'd all been waiting for, the world tuned in for the fairy tale wedding of the century. Let's face it, if you're marrying a prince, you may as well pull out all the Megan and Harry really did have the ultimate fairy tale wedding. You know, they didn't choose St. Paul's Cathedral, where, of course, we saw Charles and Diana wed. We, they didn't choose Westminster Abbey like William and Kate. They chose Windsor, which is a lot smaller and feels a lot more private. I was there at the wedding on the day, and Windsor felt like literally a fairy tale come to life. Everything was magical. And as the 600 guests drifted in, it was a veritable who's who world's A-listers from music, film and sport. I think this was the very first really modern royal wedding that we've ever seen and it was a true marriage of Hollywood royalty with British royalty. Oprah Winfrey, Idris Elba, George Clooney and Amal and the cast of Suits. You had Hollywood stars mingling with British aristocracy. It was extraordinary to see. By the time HRH arrived, the atmosphere at Windsor was electric, with 200 representatives from the Prince's charities among the 2,640 cheering on the boys, included Princess Charlotte and Prince George, plus the children of some of her closest friends. Sporting the uniform of the Blues and Royals, the regiment Harry served in in the army, the groom arrived with a familiar-looking best man. Right on cue, Meghan arrived with Mum Doria in the Queen's Rolls-Royce Phantom Four. The wedding was phenomenal. The wedding was amazing. I mean, we all wanted to see what she was wearing. And we weren't disappointed. When Meghan stepped out in a Givenchy dress with a veil featuring flora and fauna from 53 Commonwealth countries. Topped off with her something borrowed from the Queen, Queen Mary's diamond bandeau tiara. But with an absent father, who would walk Meghan down the aisle? Prince Charles rises 
to the occasion, Prince Charles walks her down the aisle. It's amazing, hashtag the power of love, hashtag love survives. When you saw it on the day, it felt like the right thing to do. It was a wonderful way of Charles saying, welcome to the family. And actually of Meghan showing the world just how close she already is to her father-in-law. Meghan had successfully won over her in-laws. And here it was on display for all the world to see. It was lovely. It was really lovely. It felt positive. And yeah, you couldn't help but smile watching it. When the night has come. So, not only had Meghan married a prince, but she had ensured that their wedding would be one that the British public would never forget. And neither would the 60 million who tuned in from around the globe. No, I won't be afraid. It wasn't your typical royal wedding. We had been told by courtiers to expect some surprises, but I don't think anyone expected quite what we saw. Listening to that incredible gospel choir, which was a beautiful touch and a wonderful nod to Meghan's dual heritage. Inside, you've got the gospel choir, you know, raising the roof with the music. You've got the reverend. Was one of the stars one of the unexpected stars of the day. I don't think anyone was expecting his sermon. I certainly don't think the royal family were expecting his sermon because the look of surprise, and I might say amusement and bewilderment on some of their faces seemed to suggest that they were quite taken aback. We must discover the power of love, the redemptive power of love. And when we do that, we will make of this old world a new world. He started speaking. He just had everybody on the edge of their seats, whether you were there or you were watching it on the, on the television. The room felt alive. I don't think St George's Chapel has ever heard such an effusive um, address or heard Martin Luther King quoted in that way. There's power in love. Don't underestimate it. Don't even over-sentimentalise it. There's power, power in love. You know, there is power in love, and if we hadn't heard it once, it was drilled into us, so we knew that by the end of his sermon. Well, there's power, power in love. Her family weren't there, it was just her mother, but her story, her African-American heritage, that was all beautifully reflected in the ceremony and in the day itself. All these things that are really very Megan just made you realize how much more the world is coming together. It was poignant, powerful stuff. Meghan, I give you this ring. Meghan, I give you this ring. As a sign of our marriage. As a sign of our marriage. By the joining of hands and by the giving and receiving of rings. I therefore proclaim that they are husband and wife. <laughs> she'd done it. She got the ring and she'd married her prince. Watching that wedding, you know, even if you're not a royalist and you, you're not a, a romantic, you really couldn't help but be taken in by it because it was two people that actually seemed like they were really in love, um, which on any level is, is just so nice to see. The party was only just getting started. Serena Williams playing beer pong. I bet she aced it. Meghan had gone from actress to duchess. And our penultimate tip, really for those who've gone and bagged their prints, is celebrate with the best ever party. Immediately after the wedding, the couple had all 600 guests back to St George's Hall for a wedding breakfast, which was hosted by Her Majesty the Queen. Um, but the real golden ticket to that event was the private evening party, which was hosted at Frogmore that evening by Prince Charles. We saw, of course, Meghan's dress for the after-after party, which was by Stella McCartney. She looked glamorous. Harry looked like James Bond walking out of the palace to get into their vintage Jaguar. This was a very modern, sexy, gorgeous couple. We saw the couple speed away in that beautiful blue E-type Jaguar. Meghan resplendent, it has to be said. Harry looking more James Bond than Prince Harry.
anyone who was anyone was there, sipping on their When Harry Met Meghan ginger and rum cocktails. George and Amal, Serena Williams, James Corden and Idris Elba, who turned DJ for the night and span a few tunes. I was put forward to DJ. I really wanted to DJ. I would have done the best wedding set in the world. <laughs> It must have been incredible. Everyone's probably a bit more relaxed, you know, a bit more loose, getting on the cocktails, having a chill. Everyone just wanted to know the juicy details of this VVIP party. Were these huge Hollywood stars and celebrities doing the same kind of things we do when we've been drinking since about midday? Yes, they were. There's some wonderful tales of Serena Williams beating everyone hands down at beer pong, a drinking game that apparently Meghan and Harry loved. Serena Williams playing beer pong. I bet she aced it. Serena has since denied she played this game. Shame. But who knows, maybe when they throw their next party. George Clooney serving up cocktails and whisking Meghan and Kate around the dance floor. A dance-off instigated by James Corden between Princess William, Charles and Harry. Which we like. Imagine, look like this. Come on, well, it's my I... reception. Good You're gonna... few. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, come Ooh, on. We like that, brother. Yeah, twerk it, wheels. Uh, the twerk it, wheels. Uh, there you go. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no, Grandmom just saw that. Bollocks. All right. Uh. <laughs> Having an absolute laugh. I mean, was the Queen there? What was she doing? Was she, was she watching it? Was she getting involved? Go for it. Let's have a laugh. Let's enjoy this. I think it was just a fantastic fantastic night where the couple were able to really do things their way from serving dirty burgers at midnight out of posh burger stalls in the grounds of Frogmore to handing out monogram slippers so that their guests in those six inch Louboutins or whatever they were wearing could actually rest their weary feet come the end of the night. And if you want to ensure you throw the best party ever, be like Megan and make sure your guests leave their phones at the door so you can let your hair down without any sneaky snappers. You don't want a repeat of the dramas of previous royal wedding. <laughs> Ten years earlier, the same venue had hosted the wedding reception of Harry's cousin, Peter Phillips, and his wife, Autumn Kelly, who provoked a scandal when, unbeknownst to most of the guests, they sold photos of the private bash to Hello! magazine for half a million pounds. Generally, what happens in the private do's stays in the uh, private do's. There are no cameras there, or none of our cameras are there. So what happened with Peter and Autumn's wedding controversial and unusual. The junior roles, it's a wedding ceremony, which is where they're supposed to be the private situation, the most private the roles are ever in, inside their own home, for goodness sake. And they thought this was just photographers at a wedding and happily posed and grinned away. And then we're quite amazed in a couple of weeks afterwards to see 59 pages of a Hello supplement dedicated entirely to things that they thought were private family shots. I think it went down like a lead balloon with many members of the royal family. Luckily, Harry and Meghan's wedding reception went off without a hitch, but with a bang. One of my favorite details about the whole thing is that uh, Harry and Meghan snuck away at the after party. They went off to be together. And I think that speaks a lot about this couple. They are, above everything else, madly, genuinely in love with each other. Which leads us beautifully into the final step of our Bag of Prince guide. Live happily ever after. What will we see next? Um, I think we will see them both just dive into work. I think there's a feeling about the two of them that they don't want to hang around. They want to, they want to get involved with their charities. She seems to be a woman with a mission, and I don't think it'll be long before we hear exactly where she's going to focus her energy. So there you have it. From being born into showbiz, to getting famous, to moving countries, making moves in royal circles, charming the in-laws, and staying silent in the face of criticism. Meghan Markle might not have set out a bag of prints, but follow her lead, and maybe you could do it too. It was the ultimate America her journey, from the leafy suburbs of LA to Toronto, to Kensington Palace, to St. George's Chapel, has been a monumental, epic, and frankly, incredible story. It's so nice to meet you. She's a modern woman.
this is how we all live, you know, from mixed race families, you know, interracial marriages, coming from different countries. That is what society is about now. The fact that she's unusual for the royal family, I think the fact that she comes from a different country, a different background, it's just a plus. She is very much a breath of fresh air. She's incredibly focused. She's incredibly driven. Women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice. They need to feel empowered to use it. And people need to be encouraged to listen. She's got the biggest platform. She's got huge ideas. And she is changing the game in a very cool way. And she makes Prince Harry happy. And so he now has that partner that he said he always wanted to share the load with. And in Meghan Markle, he found it. If this were a movie script, you would say that Meghan completes him. It's an incredible rags to riches story. It's amazing. I'm so jealous. But no one's jealous now, because what started as a fairy tale soon became a nightmare. Firstly, the couple went to war with the press, incensed by criticism, like her flaunting her baby bump. And then they launched a legal battle against the Mail on Sunday, after they published a handwritten letter Meghan had sent to her estranged father. When I, um, when I first met my now husband, my friends were really happy because I was so happy, but my British friends said to me, I'm sure he's great, but you shouldn't do it because the British tabloids will destroy your life. Next, Harry and Meghan got flack for spending nearly two and a half million pounds of public money upgrading their official residence, Frogmore Cottage. They have no plans to give up their royal home here in Windsor. It's called Frogmore Cottage, although in truth it's more of a mansion after a two and a half million pound facelift paid for by taxpayers. Their son Archie was born in May 2019 and the first signs of a royal rift were spotted when he was not given a title, instead being referred to as just master. More press criticism followed when the couple decided to use a private jet to take them on holiday. Finally, the bombshell. The couple stepped back from their royal duties, handing over their titles and jetting off to Canada, as Harry explained at this after-dinner speech. The decision that I have made for my wife and I to step back in years of challenges. And I know I haven't always gone it right, but as far as this goes, there really was no other option. You've got the most recognisable members of the royal family, international superstars, if you like, suddenly announcing tonight that they're going to step back as, as senior members of the royals. I mean, it is quite staggering news. Harry and Meghan have gone from the wedding of the decade to leaving the UK and the royal family behind in just under two years with Meghan making her very last public appearance here at the Commonwealth Day service. How could such a fairy tale descend into such misery and acrimony in such a short space of time? I never thought that this would be easy, but I thought it would be fair. Who could have imagined that what started so well could all go so horribly wrong?
dog and would often visit her dad on the set of long-running TV sitcom Married with Children. Megan had very much a showbiz upbringing. She would have been on set occasionally. She would have met famous actors and actresses probably from a young age um, and understood that they were just people and understood that there is a work that goes on behind the camera because that's what her dad did. So she would have seen the reality of what it means to be famous at a very early age. Married with children was, at the time, considered so risque, it was even boycotted by some viewers. So uh, I grew up on the set of Married with Children every day after school for 10 years. I was there. Wow. I know. It's a very perverse place for a little girl who went to Catholic school, no less, to grow up. <laughs> there were a lot of times my dad would say, Meg, why don't you go and help with the craft services room over there? This is just a little off-color for your eyes allowed to watch it at home 